Chapter 3 Putting on the Ritz The sky had cleared by the time I got back to the academy. In the porter's lodge, there was a message waiting for me from the dean, Mr. Ruprecht Pruss. At your earliest convenience, he had written, which I took to mean right away. I started down one of the great stone hallways toward his office. Narrow arched windows let in streams of late afternoon sun. The academy was largely deserted. Everyone was still out on their training tours. Mine had been cut short by five days. Coming home early was virtually unheard of, and I felt like a failure. I was worried people would think I'd been kicked off my ship because of incompetence or recklessness. I wasn't surprised Dean Pruss had summoned me. I hadn't even had a chance to write my formal report yet, but I suppose he wanted to know firsthand why I was back so early. I waited only a few minutes in the vestibule of his office before his secretary told me to go in. I understand you're a celebrity once again, Mr. Cruz, the dean said, motioning me to a chair in front of his grand desk. I was never quite sure when Mr. Pruss was being sarcastic. I took aerostatics with him, and though he rarely spoke directly to me, he sometimes talked about me before the entire class. Of course, not all of us here have been fortunate enough to land a 900-foot airship on a sandy beach like Mr. Cruz. Or, it is never advisable to have a fistfight on the airship's elevators when in flight, as Mr. Cruz might attest. At first, I'd felt flattered to be singled out like this, but after a while, it started to make me uncomfortable, as if I were some kind of circus freak, and Mr. Pruss the mocking ringmaster. He'd been a distinguished pilot until a motor car accident had confined him to a wheelchair. Some people said the accident hadn't just damaged his legs, but had left him all twisted up inside, too. It seemed perfectly understandable to me, for being landlocked would make me bitter, too. On his desk, I spotted today's newspaper, with the news of the Hyperion on the cover. He swirled it around for me to see. This is quite a story, he said. It's true, I take it? It is, sir. Perhaps you could give me your personal account. As succinctly as I could, I told him of our voyage to the Devil's Fist, and then skyward to try to salvage the Hyperion. You disobeyed the captain was the first thing Mr. Pruss said when I finished, and it shook me. Not directly, sir. He wasn't thinking properly because of the altitude. He never actually told me not to vent gas. But he did not order you to do so. No. Or to turn the ship around. No, sir. You realize what you did was a serious breach of aeronautical protocol. Yes, sir. It was, in fact, mutinous. I drew a sharp breath. Mutiny! We all would have died, sir. Perhaps, yes. I wondered if Mr. Pruss would rather I had done nothing and sent us all to an icy airborne grave. So, are you a hero or a mutineer, Mr. Cruz? An interesting question, don't you think? I did not find it at all interesting. At the time, it seemed the right thing to do, sir. Well, given Captain Tritus's conduct, I doubt this question will ever be posed in a formal Skyguard tribunal. The Flotsam used to be a perfectly respectable vessel, you know, before Tritus gained its command. We certainly won't be using it again for our trading tours. Would you agree with that, Mr. Cruz? I would, sir. He rolled his wheelchair back from the desk and moved around to the side where a patch of sunlight warmed the wood. Maybe it was just the light, but for the first time, the hardness in his face seemed to disappear, and his eyes took on a kindly glow. I saw her once too, you know, the Hyperion. We were off Rio de Janeiro, and we spotted something above us, very high. We couldn't read her name, but I saw her profile. I knew there were no ships of her type still sailing. It could only have been the Hyperion. It was quite something, I said. You know who the Hyperion was carrying, do you? Theodore Grunel. Very good. 
reputedly carrying his life's belongings and riches. And who should telegraph me this morning but the Grunel family? Yes, quite a surprise. One of Theodore's grandsons, Matthias. Once they saw the story in the papers, they made inquiries. Apparently, Captain Tritus refused to speak to them. Then they managed to get a hold of the ship's transit papers in Jakarta and found the name of the navigator. Mr. Domville, I said. That's it. They were hoping he might give them the last coordinates of the Hyperion. But apparently, he has died. For a moment, I could say nothing. I was so dismayed. The one decent man aboard the whole wretched ship. When? I asked. Just last night, of respiratory failure. If only Tritus had turned around earlier, or I had. I'm very sorry to hear that, I said. Yes, very upsetting. It seems Matthias Grunel discovered your name listed as assistant navigator in the ship's papers. He's wondering if you maybe can shed some light on the location of the Hyperion. He'd like to meet with you. He's here in Paris? Flew in this morning from Zurich. I told him I was doubtful you could be of any help. The navigational charts are no doubt with Tritus. There are no charts, I said. They were destroyed when a water tank burst. Ah, so presumably no one has accurate coordinates. I hesitated a moment and then said, I saw the exact coordinates as Mr. Domville wrote them down. Planning a little treasure hunt of your own, Mr. Cruz? I gave an uncomfortable laugh. No, sir, not at all. But I thought of Kate and all the grand plans she'd already made for us. Dean Pruss was staring at me, and for an uncomfortable moment I wondered if he was going to ask me for the coordinates. It would be a foolhardy pilot who tried to reach the Hyperion at that height, the Dean said. I agree, sir. Still, given the ship's contents, some may try. If I were younger and had my legs, maybe I'd be foolhardy enough too, who's to say? I wouldn't be surprised if the Grunels offered you a small reward for any information. That could hardly be unwelcome, eh? I wondered if he too saw the scuffs and scrapes in my uniform. What you tell them is your own business, of course. The Hyperion doesn't belong to anyone anymore. Not until someone boards her and claims the right of salvage. I thought of Kate, how, how much she wanted the frozen bestiary. I thought of all the money glinting coldly in the ship's vaults. Even Tritus did not have her coordinates, a rough idea at best given his airsick brain. The thought of him claiming the salvage was revolting to me, after what he'd done to his ship and crew. Someone's going to get her, Kate had said. Why not us? I'd been holding my breath and now let it out in a silent gust. Kate could dream if she wanted, but the Hyperion was probably untouchable. And anyway, I had more pressing things on my mind. Exams were in less than three weeks, and I had a lot of studying to do. If anyone was going to undertake a risky salvage attempt, it seemed right it should be Grunel's own family. Best to give them what they wanted, take the reward money, and be done with it. He asked if he could see you at 8 o'clock, Dean Pruss said. Across the desk, he slid a thick card embossed with the insignia of the Ritz Hotel. In beautiful script was written, Matthias Grunel, Trafalgar Suite. Of course, I took the card. Be careful, Mr. Cruz. The Grunels may not be the only people seeking those coordinates. This afternoon, apparently, there was someone asking for you at the lodge. I've instructed the porters not to give out any information about you. Thank you, sir. I felt a first flicker of apprehension. The dean looked at me carefully. You seem a sensible sort, Mr. Cruz. I don't think you'll be one to go chasing after phantom gold. Absolutely not, sir. Good lad. I dare say your thoughts are on your upcoming exams. He looked at a ledger on his desk. I see your marks in aerostatics and physics are far from satisfactory. I know, sir. Instinctive ability will take you only so far, Mr. Cruz. 
theory and mathematics are equally, if not more, important here. Past heroics will not win you a flight certificate. You've got a great deal of work ahead of you if you plan on passing your second term. Yes, sir. He rolled himself back behind the shadow of his desk. And if I could have your full written report by the end of the week, that would be most appreciated. The academy was built around a large quadrangle, where the wide arched entranceway overlooked by the porter's lodge. The dormitories occupied the south and east wings, and were divided into several houses. I was lodged in Dornier House, on the second floor, in a room just big enough for a narrow bed, a chest of drawers, a desk, and a closet. My window looked out onto the quad. It was noisy on the weekends, especially in warm weather, when the students drank and caroused until all hours. Right now the residence was eerily quiet, and I didn't like it. Apart from the prehistoric caretakers treading the hallways, there were only a few teachers, clerks, and a handful of upper-year students who, for one reason or another, hadn't gone out on training tours. In the great dining hall, the rows of long wooden refectory tables were all but deserted as I ate my supper. For company, I had only the giant portraits of famous aviators and past deans looming over me. Clement Adder, Billy Bishop, Amelia Gearhart, Henri Giffard, Camille von Zeppelin. It was humbling company to be in, and I'd certainly been humbled since coming to the Academy. I was not the star pupil everyone had expected. Before working as a cabin boy, I'd attended school for only a few years. I could read and write. I could add, subtract, and multiply. But at the Academy, I was suddenly expected to know all sorts of fancy math with symbols I'd never seen before. Working hard, I could just manage the Latin and the expository essays and the history, but those numbers vexed me to no end, jittery and slippery as eels. I just could not make sense of them. It seemed like all my years aboard the Aurora, watching and listening in the control car, counted for nothing. I had launched a 900-foot airship. I had flown her. But I could not explain how it all worked in equations and scientific laws. Some nights I would glare at the pages in my textbook, and I might as well have been trying to read Egyptian hieroglyphics. I told no one of my difficulties. I was too humiliated. I had dreamed of attending the academy. All I'd ever wanted to do was fly. I looked up into the pale eyes of Dean Pross's portrait and swallowed down the rest of my food with some difficulty. He was right. Instinctive ability was not enough. I was not good at school, but I would work harder. If others could learn it, I could learn it. I would work until I mastered those numbers and made them do their tricks for me. I gave the dean's portrait a wink and left the dining room. Nearly all the windows were dark as I crossed the quad. I'd be glad when everyone returned from their tours and the academy was back to its usual bustling self. My heels clapped too loudly against the paving stone. Maybe it was the dean's words about a stranger asking for me, but I felt ill at ease. My eyes fell into their crow's nest rhythm, scanning the horizons for hidden dangers. I hurried into Dornier House, feeling silly. I had a little time before heading off to the Ritz, so I buffed up my shoes and put on a clean shirt. I hoped my uniform was enough to get me past the doorman. Where are you off to then? Douglas, the night porter, called out as I passed the lodge. Oh, just a meeting at the Ritz, I said. Quite the man of the world now, aren't we? I gave a cheery wave as I pushed through the great oak door and started down the steps. At the bottom, I glanced back over my shoulder. To the left of the academy's vaulted entranceway, someone was standing in the shadows among the ornamental shrubs and trees. Not exactly lurking, but not really wanting to be noticed either. I did not stop, but kept walking and turned onto the busy avenue that ran along the river. It was raining lightly, so I unfurled my umbrella. After 20 steps, I looked back toward the academy 
and could no longer see the figure by the doors. There were plenty of people behind me on the sidewalk now, most with their faces half hidden beneath their umbrellas. Horse-drawn carriages and motor cars vied noisily for space on the road. Barges and pleasure boats glittered on the water. Across the sign, the city glowed invitingly. The man at the newspaper kiosk gave me a friendly nod as I passed. The whole idea of being followed seemed idiotic right now. Shenanigans from a penny novelette. Coming across Place de la Concorde and into the Tuileries gardens, I left behind the crowds and noise. It was suddenly darker among the trees. The sound of motor cars and horses dulled. My unease returned. Up ahead, a great fountain trilled water. I turned onto a path that would take me more quickly back to the street. Excuse me. I doubt I would have stopped if it hadn't been a girl's voice. I turned. It was a gypsy girl, no older than me. She wore a long leather coat. An exotic scarf was wrapped around her head. Strands of night black hair hung damply across her face and forehead. She did not have an umbrella. From the moment I set foot in Paris, I had been warned about the gypsies. They'd rob you blind, a train porter had told me. They didn't even need to touch you, a shop owner had commented. They could spirit your pocketbook from your vest just by looking you in the eye. Do you have a minute to talk? Her accent was English, I noticed. I'm in a hurry, I said. She took a step closer. I watched her hands. I just want to talk to you. I stepped back. No, I really must go. I heard the pretty one sometimes distracted you while two or three of their burly men came up behind and thumped you on the head. You can't be afraid of me, she said, half amused. I don't know you. Are you Matt Cruz? How did you know? I asked foolishly. Monsieur, is this woman troubling you? I turned to see a gendarme approaching with a lantern and a billy club. No, officer, but I must go. I'm late. The gendarme turned to the girl. You heard the gentleman now. He doesn't wish to speak with you any longer. Are you living here in Paris or just passing through? That's none of your business. It's precisely my business when dealing with your sort. And what sort is that? Gypsies, mademoiselle. I'm a Roma. Call it what you will. I walked away, feeling guilty at leaving the girl in the clutches of the gendarme. But I was truly unsettled now. Was she the one lurking in the doorway of the academy? Had she followed me all the way? Perhaps Dean Pruss was right, and there were many people hungry for information about the Hyperion, people who might wish me harm. I quickened my pace, and within minutes I was in the place of Vendôme, encircled by sparkling restaurants and bars and boutiques. The Ritz, with its blazing windows and honeyed stone, radiated luxury and safety. An enormous doorman, clad in a brass-buttoned coat that looked like it could sink a battleship, stood before the hotel's entrance. "'Can I help you, monsieur?' he inquired. I pulled Grunel's card from my pocket and held it out to the doorman. He glanced at it and then pushed the door wide. The Ritz had no lobby. I'd heard they didn't want to give room to undesirables who might come in hoping for a peek or a photograph of the rich and famous. I stepped quickly toward the elevators. Which floor, sir? The elevator boy couldn't have been more than ten. He looked tired, the poor lad. I hope they didn't work him too hard here. Paris was filled with young working boys and girls, too, their eyes ringed with soot and exhaustion. The Trafalgar Suite, please. As he was closing the mesh screen, I saw the gypsy girl rush into the hotel, nimbly pulling free from the doorman's grip. Her eyes swept the hall and locked with mine. Matt Cruz, wait! She called out, hurrying toward me, but the elevator was already starting to rise. Just a moment of your time, please! She shouted as we lifted out of sight. The last thing I saw was the doorman striding angrily toward her, telling her in no uncertain terms to clear off. Hestering you, is she, sir? 
asked the elevator boy. I don't know her, I muttered. And yet she had known my name. My heart was pounding. She was just a girl, not some hooded thug. But the blazing urgency in her face and eyes shocked me. I wondered who on earth she was. Old Serge will have her out in no time, said the elevator boy. Now then, the Trafalgar Suite is just down the hall to your left, sir. Thank you. I gave him all the spare change in my pocket and made my way to the door. It was a vast expanse of darkly lustrous, coffered wood with a single button in the middle. I pressed it. The man who opened the door was dressed in a velvet dinner jacket. He was a big fellow and might have appeared a brute except for his trim ginger beard, which lent him an air of distinction. He smoked a long brown cigarette. I'm Matt Cruz, I told him. Matthias Grunel. He held out his free hand and we shook. His grip was powerful. Please come in. He led me through a small foyer into a large sitting room, sumptuously decorated with enough brass and gilt and leather to put the King of Bohemia to shame. The walls were paneled with an elaborate crown molding at the base of the ceiling. The fireplace was marble, no doubt Italian. Enormous sprays of fresh flowers were arranged on the various sideboards and bureaus and tables and armoires. Thank you so much for coming, Grinnell said. Would you like to sit down? I lowered myself into an armchair so deep I nearly fell backward. I perched on the edge, suddenly not knowing where to put my legs and hands. I wish Kate were here with me. She'd know what to do among fancy people. The curtains were still parted, giving a wide view of the Place Vendôme. Drizzle glittered in the spotlight beams aimed at the great bronze column in the square center. Hieroglyphs swirled around it all the way to the top, where a statue of Napoleon stood, looking quite smug. Cigarettes, Mr. Cruz? No, thank you. A whiskey. Or something else, perhaps. Port? Brandy? He gestured to an array of crystal bottles on the drinks table. Uh, thank you, no. Too young for such bad old habits. He poured himself a tumbler of some amber liquid and sat down opposite me on a sofa. It really is awfully good of you to come. Mr. Prost has explained why we're here, I imagine. He has, yes. I'm sure you can understand how we, my family, would like to reclaim our grandfather's belongings. Of course. Mr. Prost said you were one of his top students. If he did, he was being very kind, I replied. You were working as a navigator aboard the Flotsam, yes? Assistant to Mr. Domville. I understand it was a pretty rough ride. It was indeed. But it must have been something to see the Hyperion. It really was very strange, sir. His sleeves were just a little too short. I might not have noticed it, except that he had astonishingly hairy wrists and forearms, and whenever he lifted his cigarette to his mouth or reached for his tumbler on the side table, his sleeves would shoot up and reveal his hairiness. Matthias Grunel was wealthy as sin, so why on earth would he be wearing an expensive jacket that was too small for him? I'd worked three years aboard a luxury airship liner, and one thing I'd noticed about the rich, their clothes always fit. I wondered if Matthias Grunel had already squandered his family's fortune, and was now down and out just trying to put on a good show. You're a resourceful young fellow by all accounts, said Grunel. Your dean wasn't sure how much you might remember, but obviously, we'd be extremely grateful for any information you could give us. And my family feels very strongly that if we do recover the Hyperion, you should receive a full 5% of its value. That's really too generous, sir. The newspaper had calculated the airship's contents at 50 million Europas. Whether this was a reasonable guess or complete invention, I had no way of knowing. But that would mean two and a half million just for me. It was too mind-boggling as some to even contemplate. 
It was enough for five lifetimes. We would insist, said Grunel with a smile. After all, without your coordinates, how else could we hope to find the ship? It's been a source of great sorrow to me that my grandfather was never able to fulfill his final wishes. My grandfather was a very loving man, Mr. Cruz. Matthias Grunel faltered for a moment, perhaps overcome with emotion. He stood and turned his back to me, staring out the window. He would have been so distressed to think that his beloved son and most cherished daughter and all their offspring had never benefited from the fruits of his great fame and industry. If we can recover the Hyperion and my grandfather's body, I feel his soul will at last be able to rest in peace. He turned toward me and exhaled a long rapier blade of cigarette smoke. I swallowed, feeling queasy. This man was not Matthias Grunel. I suspected it the moment I'd seen his sleeves ride up, and now I knew it with sickening certainty. It was the mention of Grunel's cherished daughter. Hadn't Kate told me Theodore Grunel had had a falling out with his only daughter, cut her off without a penny? Kate would not get a detail like that wrong. She was a voracious and attentive reader. I trusted her completely. Gingerbeard here was an imposter. From the drinks table, he picked up a notepad and pencil and brought them over to me. If you were working the charts, you probably have a pretty good idea of the Hyperion's coordinates. I took the pencil and started writing some numbers, then scribbled them out and put on a show of chewing my lip and frowning. What was it now? You see, sir, we'd just gone through the devil's fist and were mightily off course. I was not going to offer up the coordinates to this imposter, whoever he was. My only thoughts now were of getting away. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what the dean told you, but my memory's never been my strong point, and the air was so thin up there. We were at 20,000 feet, you know. I don't think my brain was working its best. Ah said Gingerbeard. Of course, but you can probably remember the rough coordinates, no? The charts would have been before you the whole time, surely. I know, sir, it's just... I screwed my eyes shut, tapping my pencil against the pad, trying to look a proper imbecile. It's very embarrassing, sir. Please don't tell the dean. He was smiling hard at me, but it was not a kindly smile. Just think of the reward that could await you. Think hard now. I took a deep breath, wrote down a set of coordinates that were off by several hundred miles, and handed them over. There, I think that's it, I said, standing up. I really should get back now, if you don't mind. Exams are coming up and... Strange, though, said Gingerbeard, and I felt myself start to sweat beneath my arms. I thought the flotsam was bound for Alexandria over the Indian Ocean. These coordinates are well over the subcontinent. Only a mariner of the sea or sky could glance at raw longitude and latitude and fix them instantly on a map. Oh, I said, downcast. I've bungled it then. I'm sorry. I'm not more used to you. Hard pounding, I turned and stepped toward the door. Lads! Gingerbeard shouted, I think our boy needs some help remembering. The room was suddenly full of men, striding in from various doorways. Unlike Gingerbeard, they wore no velvet smoking jackets. Clad in dark trousers, coarse shirts rolled back to the elbows, boots and caps, they emanated the unmistakable whiff of oil, aruba fuel, and hydrium that marked them as airship men. Two of them seized me by the shoulders and pushed me back into the center of the room, face to face with Gingerbeard. Don't lie to me, boy, he said. You're no simpleton. I really don't know, I insisted, seeing the exact coordinates swirl before my mind's eye. Part of me wondered if I shouldn't just tell and be done with it, but if I were to tell them, they might just as easily bundle me out the window to keep me eternally quiet. Shall I give him some stars to see? said one of the men, pulling back his fist. No, Gingerbeard said sharply. Show some respect, Bingham. 
This is Mr. Matt Cruz, Pirate Slayer. We know all about you, Cruz. Wrote about how you bested our late lamented colleague, Mr. Spearglass. With a sickening jolt, I wondered if these scoundrels were the last dregs of Spearglass's crew come to wreak their revenge. Don't worry, said Gingerbeard with a wink. There was no love lost between me and Spearglass. He and I parted ways years ago. I'm no pirate. That's nasty coarse work. My name's John Rath. My colleagues and I were employed by some of the finest people in London and Paris. You'd be surprised. Think of us as private investigators. I said nothing. I'm here to make you a proposition, Cruz. I like what I've heard of you. You're a smart lad. Not nearly as gullible as that dean of yours. He went for my Matthias Grunel story, hook, line, and sinker. One of Rath's men gave a snort of derision. Rath nodded appraisingly at me. And anyone who can send Vikram Spearglass to a watery grave is worth ten of these great hulks behind you. No offense, lads, he said to his henchmen. I think you and I can do business together, Mr. Cruz. What say you? There's money in it. Plenty. You like money, don't you? I said nothing, but I thought of the elevator boy. I thought of my second-hand uniform. I thought of my mother, her finger joints swollen and shiny with rheumatism, wincing as she sewed. It's very tempting, I said. Maybe if I played along, I would find a chance to break free. Good then. What say we take you for a little ride and talk some more? Convince you said Rath, and if not, dangling over the river from a thousand feet can often be very persuasive. Come along, gents, we're checking out. Two of them grabbed my arms and started marching me out of the room. John Rath downed his drink and grabbed a full bottle of whiskey. I've quite enjoyed putting on the Ritz, he said, but only a fool would pay for it. Out we went. An elderly couple was walking down the corridor toward us, but shrank back in terror as the men shouted at them to clear off. I considered bellowing for help, but doubted it would do me much good. We reached the stairwell. Rath kicked the door open, and up we went. At the top of the stairs, they flung another door wide, and I was dragged out onto the roof of the Ritz. Drizzle wet my face. The glow from the large skylight illuminated the underbelly of a small airship hovering silently a few feet off the roof. It was tied up with only bow and stern lines. As we moved toward her, twin propellers gave a cough and began to turn. Get him on board, said Gingerbeard. I gave a mighty jerk and twist and was free, but it was no good. One of the men kicked me onto my knees and they had me again, tighter than before. From the airship, a gangway sprang down, revealing a rectangle of pale light. Gingerbeard led the way. A smudge of movement caught my eye. A shadowy figure slipped from the darkness of the roof and crouched before the ship's bow line. With a quick tug, it was loose. There was shouting from the control car, and a spotlight flared from its underside. The shadowy figure ran, grabbed hold of the forward landing line, and gave a strong shove. The ship was lighter than air and moved easily, swinging in a swift, wide arc, held only by her stern line. Steady her! Ginger Beard shouted to his men from the hatchway. The ship came straight for us, propellers whirling. We all threw ourselves to the gravel roof. The airship roared overhead, buffeting me with its engine wash. With a start, I realized I was free. Come here, one of the pirates barked lunging at me on all fours. I kicked him in the chin, scrambled up, and started running. Someone touched my arm, and I looked to see the gypsy girl keeping pace with me. Her headscarf was gone, and her long black hair was tucked inside the collar of her overcoat. This way, she said, veering towards the roof's edge. Can you jump? Oh, I can jump. Then jump! She sped ahead and leaped without even hesitating. Her leather coat flared out behind her like wings, and I thought, I'd like a coat like that. She touched down on the next building, arms wide for balance. My strides lengthened, and I took flight, 
my body thrilling as it soared over the lane far below. I hit the gravel running and caught up with the girl. Blinking away the rain, I turned to look back at the Ritz. A couple of pirates stood at the roof's edge, silhouetted briefly by their airship's spotlight as it soared over them, heading for us. There! I puffed, racing toward an access door jutting from the roof. The ship's drone deepened. I rattled the door, but it would not budge, rickety as it was. There was the crack of a pistol, and we cowed as the airship shot overhead and began to turn. We had to get off the roof, but I could see no other exit. We've got to jump again, said the girl, and launched herself into a run. We only had a few precious seconds before the airship was upon us. There was only one other building close enough. It was not so very far, but it was lower than the Ritz, and would be quite a drop. We had only a moment to pick a likely spot, then sped up and soared across, and down, landing hard among the chimney stacks and wooden water tanks. Cloaked in shadow, we ran across the long stretch of rooftops, leaping alleys when needed. The airship hounded us, its spotlight fixing us time and again. They dropped a couple of men down onto the roof, and we could hear them behind us trying to hem us in. Aim for the legs! I heard Wrath shout at them from the airship above. I want them alive! This was not an encouraging thing to hear. Up ahead, I could see the roof ending, and beyond that, a great canyon between us and the next building. It's big! The gypsy girl panted. Too big! I said. To our left and right were high brick walls, no ladders or likely footholds to be seen. We were cut off. Before us, the roof angled down sharply, a slate toboggan ride, ridged with garret windows. You've no fear of heights, puffed the girl. None, I said. I've heard that about you. The airship skidded overhead, and gunfire pockmarked the shingle. The ship's wake nearly toppled me over. The gypsy skipped over the roof's edge and skidded crazily down the slate. She grabbed a weather vane, twirled around it, and swung herself in through the open window of a garret. I heard a shriek of surprise from inside. I could only follow. Down I went, surfing on slate and hoping I would not overshoot the weather vane. I clutched at it and felt it bend far out, nearly spilling me off the roof altogether. My feet scrabbled against the shingles. Before me, the airship was turning, and I saw Wrath leaning out of the hatch, pistol cocked. I heaved myself through the open window. It was not a graceful landing. Some bit of furniture shattered beneath me, and there was the sound of broken glass, and I was sprawled on the floor in the most undignified manner. I scrambled to my feet and found myself in a bedroom. An attractive young woman in her corset and petticoats stood screaming at the gypsy girl in French. Pardonnez-moi, mademoiselle, I said, just running for our lives. We hastily found the door of the apartment and clattered down the corridor and into the stairwell. The sound of our wild breathing reverberated off the walls. I was barely aware of my feet touching the steps. Everything was a blur. Suddenly, we were outside in the dark and drizzle, and we hurled ourselves down a narrow cobbled street, and then another, intent only on escaping the sound of propellers.